Joshua chapter one. Read along with me please, it says, Now it came about after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' servant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, cross this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, to the sons of Israel. Every place on which the sole of your foot treads, I have given it to you, just as I spoke to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and as far as the great sea toward the setting of the sun, will be your territory. And so begins the book of Joshua that chronicles the life and times of its author, who succeeded Moses in leading the people into the promised land after their 40 years of wanderings in the, in the wilderness. In this opening chapter, God promises Joshua complete success, um, complete success, complete uh, protection in his efforts to take over the land inhabited by fierce pagan nations and nations, many of which were heavily armed and experienced in the art of war. Now in this chapter alone, God encourages Joshua three times to be strong and courageous while promising him total victory and safety. Now that brings up a, a contradiction, if you wish. Think about it for a minute. If you're going to win and God is with you, why should you need to be strong and courageous? I mean, you're going to win. After all, if God gives you a sure thing, why should you even try to be strong and courageous? Well, the uh, reading of the next couple of chapters would explain why someone would need to be strong and courageous even in the face of a sure thing. You see, Joshua heard God's command to take the land and he heard God's promise that he will surely win and he heard of God's encouragement, be strong, be courageous. Later on, Joshua found out why he needed strength and courage despite the guarantee of victory from God. He found out, first of all, that leadership would be difficult. Leadership would be difficult. Let's keep reading in chapter one, verse five. It says, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life, just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. I will not fail you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall give this people possession of the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. And so God promised that He would be with Joshua just as He had been with Moses. In other words, He would guide and confirm Joshua's leadership like He had done uh, the leadership and the ministry of Moses. But, he did not guarantee that the people would follow, nor did it guarantee that the enemy would just kind of lie down and give up without a fight. Joshua needed courage and strength because the people would rebel. The people would be unfaithful. The people would act in a cowardly way just as they had done under Moses' leadership. You know, he said, your, your leadership is going to be like Moses. Wait a minute, let me think about that. <laughs> All the trouble that Moses had with these people. And God is saying, you know, buck up, be of courage, you're going to have the same kind of leadership because you're going to have the same kind of people to lead. So God had promised to be with Moses too and that he would succeed. But it took 40 long years of struggle and heartache to bring them to the point of victory. Joshua would also need strength and courage because the enemy was cunning and there were constant challenges to his own leadership. He was a leader guaranteed a victory by God, but not before he would face many trials and many disappointments. Yes, he was going to win, but God didn't say it was going to be an easy victory. You kind of have to read between the lines. 
Joshua also needed strength and courage because the people that he led were weak and sinful. Keep reading verse seven this time. It says, only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you may have success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. So the people that he led were, were weak and sinful. You know, God provided the assurance of success based on obedience to His word and the people had shown a terrible disposition for disobedience. You're going to have victory, he says, if everybody obeys. But their track record for 40 years is that they had been disobedient. It required strength and courage to continually teach God's word in the face of overwhelming paganism. It required courage to remain faithful to it with such a strong influence that was surrounding them. They were in the wilderness, but it's not that, it's not that they were in a vacuum. There were influences from nations around them. It was easy for sinful men to assume that their military successes, for example, was based on their physical abilities and their bravery and not part of God's providence for them. Only a morally strong leader could maintain faith in the face of such national pride and chest beating. Hey, we did this ourselves. We conquered these people ourselves. To obey God's word when unsure to maintain God's commands when the world and its allurements surrounded him required the highest form of courage and commitment. Joshua would need to keep the standard of God's word if he wished to see the victory promised by the Lord. And then one other thing, he needed strength and courage because, well, as just to remind us, because first of all, leadership in itself would be difficult. Secondly, the people were weak and sinful. The people that he led were not easy to lead. And thirdly, and I think most importantly, the journey that he was going on would be a long journey. Verse nine says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Yes, God would be with them, but they didn't realize how long the process would be before they saw complete victory. I mean, they had to learn about the land itself and they had to fight many campaigns over several decades before their goal could be reached. There were times when the wars were going badly or there was a lull in the action. There were even moments when uh, there was infighting between the tribes themselves. And during these long periods, it was easy to forget the promise or begin doubting the promise because the immediate circumstances didn't look anything like a victory. And it was during these down periods where Satan offered his most tempting items in the form of idolatry or sexual immorality or just plain old worldliness. You know, if you're just going for a sprint, Okay to be faithful, okay to be you know, busy and active just for a sprint, but over a long year, decade long marathon, being faithful, obeying the word, that was going to become quite a challenge. And yet God's promise was there all along, shadowing them as it were, from battle to battle, from temptation to temptation. Joshua and the people had to remain strong and courageous in order to keep the promise in full view despite the long and arduous journey in order to get to the end of that journey. You know, as we read the book of Joshua, we see that the people did not succeed because they disobeyed God. All this great encouragement that they received at the beginning as they entered in, and when you read the books and when you go through the Old Testament and the history, you see you know, they, didn't quite, they didn't quite live up to the promise. They did possess the land, 
but not to the extent that God had wanted them to. And because they permitted certain pagan nations to survive, they, those pagan nations became a snare to them, became a, 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 an instance of stumbling to that nation. They were later influenced because of this to go into idolatry by the very people that they, uh, that they preserved. You know, it's easy for us to criticize them for losing a sure thing, but before we do, we need to realize that we're in pretty much the same situation today as they were in back then. You know, it's interesting that Marty was talking this morning about the idea that you know, we, uh, this is a difficult place. The United States in this day and age, you know, it's not easy, being, not easy being a Christian. Well, in the same way, you know, we look at them and say, boy, how, how, could, they, how could they fumble the ball? It was, a, it was a gimme, it was easy. And they did. Well, in the same way, we, we have these promises ourselves. We've been given a guaranteed situation as well. We've been given a sure thing by God through Jesus Christ. You know, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, familiar passage, God makes a promise that those who repent and are baptized, they will be forgiven. They will receive the Holy Spirit. It's a sure thing. And in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, Jesus gives a guarantee that those who remain faithful to the end will be saved. It's a promise, it's a lock, it's a gimme. In John chapter 6, verse 40, there's an assurance that all of Jesus' disciples will be raised from the dead in order to be with God forever. A promise. It's not, well, if I'm feeling good on that day, it's if you are faithful to the end, I will raise you up on the last day. I promise it. Remember, the same person, the same being who said, let there be light, and there was light, that person says to us, remain faithful to the end, and I will resurrect you to eternal life. It's a sure thing. And so these things are promises. They're a gimme. They're a sure thing, a guarantee from God of even better things that were promised to the Jews in Joshua's days. Well, what, what were the Jews looking for? They were looking for a place to live where they could plant their vineyards and they can plant olive trees and they could eat from the land and so on. That's what they were promised. But we're promised eternal life. And we understand the nature and the substance of the eternal life that we're promised, that we will be conscious of who we are and who God is forever. That's the promise, that's the sure thing that we've been given. However, despite the fact that these promises and these guarantees from God, we too, need to have strength and courage for several reasons. First of all, we need to have strength and courage because, well, being leaders for Christ is still difficult. Yes, we're going to heaven, that's a promise, and we want to lead others there too, but there's no guarantee that others want to follow or the world will cooperate with us. From the very beginning, there have been, at the worst of times, persecutions and martyrdom of those who proclaim Christ. And in the best of times, there is still general disbelief and marginalization of those who encourage others to follow the narrow way of Jesus. I'm convinced sometimes that young people don't want to go into ministry, for example, because they just can't take the rejection. They just can't take being marginalized. They just can't take being laughed at. You need strength and courage to continue preaching the gospel and serving in the name of the Lord when others think that you're just wasting your time and your energy. My family was always disappointed in me because I became a preacher. My family was always embarrassed by me. I remember once I was at my mother-in-law's, it was Christmas, you know, and, and my niece 
had a new boyfriend and, 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 and he came to the Christmas party and so on and so forth and we were just sitting there and you know, as people do, you know, everybody's, oh, hey, Merry Christmas and you know, so on and so forth. And so he turned to me and he said, so what do you do? And I said, I'm a minister. And he went, oh. <laughs> like he had stepped in something, you know? <laughs> and it was like, the look on his face, I mean, I had to laugh, it was like, oh, oh how do I? back up from this guy because he might talk to me about religion. They were embarrassed by what I did. My mom, bless her soul, she, she would have been so happy had I gone into politics, <laughs> of all things. But a minister, a preacher, it was like there was this little nod of the head, you know, so what does your son do, Jane? Oh, he's, he's a minister. You know, what are you going to do? Maybe he'll grow out of it. She once told me, I'll give you two years, tops. Two years tops for this Christianity thing. That was 35 years ago. You know, there are a lot of people who don't want to follow you as you follow Christ. There are even many who would like you to stop following Christ yourself in order to accommodate them. And so you need to be strong and courageous because Christian leadership was never easy, is never easy, will never be easy until the Lord comes. Christians today also need to be strong and courageous because we are weak and sinful. You know, it seems so easy. Repent and be baptized, your sins, all of them are forgiven. Believe in Jesus to the end, you will be resurrected. And yet Paul cries out in Romans 7, 24, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Now here's a man who has uh, done miracles, he's been in prison for his faith, he's established churches, he's trained others, he's produced inspired writings, and yet when he looks at himself, what does he see? He looks in the mirror and he sees, oh wretched man that I am, I'm a sinner. And in another place he says, I'm the chief of sinners, I'm the worst sinner. And here, a human being filled with good intention and faithful service, trapped in a sinful body. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound at all familiar? Even if we know God loves us, and we love Him, and we are going to heaven, our lives are filled with doubt and temptation and failure. Why? Because, well, because of sin, that's why. We need courage and strength to overcome these obstacles in order to remain true to the course that we have set, and that is to follow Jesus Christ, and we don't add this other part here. That is to follow Jesus Christ no matter what. So go ahead and laugh at me, and go ahead and be disappointed in me, and go ahead and reject me, but I'm staying true to Christ no matter what. That strength that I'm talking about and that courage that I'm talking about comes from the same place that provided it for Joshua and the children of Israel. And that's God's holy word. I don't know about you, but you know, when I do my own personal Bible reading, I don't mean at the office or anything, I mean at home, you know, when I take my own time just to read the Bible, to be quiet, it's as if I enter a world. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's as if I enter a familiar world with familiar people that I've known for so long 
as I read their stories, as, as I enter into their adventures, as I, as I share their failures and their triumphs. You know, it's as if I open a door and for the time that I'm reading and I'm in the Word, it's like I, I've entered into a world. A world that I so want to be in all the time. But the telephone rings and the mailman comes by and life goes on in, in, in this place. But in the daily reading, in the regular study, in the weekly exhortation from the word, God provides for us the spiritual power that we need to remain faithful despite the ravages of sin in our lives and around our lives. Because I'll tell you something, it's not just the sin in my life that hurts me, it's the sin in your life that hurts me too. And it's, in the, sin, it's the sin in my life that hurts you. And it's not easy to remain faithful as we witness all of this damage around us all the time. We need to be strong and we need to be courageous because we are sinful people, forgiven, but nevertheless sinful. And we live among people who are very sinful and not forgiven. We also need to be strong and courageous because Christian leadership is difficult we are weak and sinful, and thirdly, you know where I'm going, the journey is long. You know, when the Jews came out of Egypt, they thought that they would be in the promised land in a matter of weeks, but it took 40 long years. When you come out of the waters of baptism, you don't know where the Lord will lead you or allow you to go. Wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be so nice just to go straight to heaven. You come, you, the last words you hear in your physical body is, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you feel the water covering you, and then as they bring you out, you are in paradise with God. You are with Christ. Well, wouldn't that, some have experienced that, very few, but some have known that experience from the water to the heaven right away. But most of us do not. The period between the time we're baptized and the period between that time and we die and wait for the resurrection, you know, that, that period there, that's a pretty long time. Sometimes there's a period of rapid spiritual and personal growth, but Christian life has also long, long stretches of difficult road, difficulties with illness, Difficulties with loneliness, difficulty with spiritual dryness, difficulty with family and professional difficulty and problems and financial things and so on and so forth. And sometimes the difficulty is just plain old boredom. You know, more marriages end because of boredom than anything else. People just get bored with their stuff. They get bored with their partner. They get bored with their spiritual life. It's just same old, same old. Well, you know what? I tell young people, there's a lot of same old, same old in life, amen? Only old people answering that one. <laughs> Many of these times are caused by our own sins and our own foolishness, but just as many times we are the victims of someone else's carelessness or evil, ignorance or selfishness. It requires strength and courage to maintain faith and hope and especially love when it seems that the end of our suffering will never, ever, ever come. But the end does come and for those who have endured there will be a glorious welcome given by the Lord Himself. Imagine the feeling of those who crossed the Jordan to enter into the promised land. The joy that they had. If you ever doubt, you know, a great study is to go back through the Bible and uh, examine all the promises that God made and kept. And you'll find that His batting average is 100%. 
if you doubt, even for a moment, the promises that He's made to you and to me about forgiving us, about accepting us, about staying with us, about resurrecting us from the dead. The promises that He gave to them, He kept, and He recorded them as a way of encouraging us to believe that the promises that He makes to us, He will also keep. And so if you're among those who have been given the sure thing of salvation, the guarantee of heaven by Christ, but you've been on the journey a long time and met with disbelief and opposition or you've struggled with Satan's temptations or you've suffered pain and sorrow, be strong, I tell you. Have courage, I say. The Lord has seen your way. He knows your heart and is intimately acquainted with every single bit of your suffering. He knows it. If your courage is lagging, if your resolve is weak, remember Joshua who entered in after 40 years. Remember Paul who withstood the opposition and even his own feelings of inadequacy to eventually say the following, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, I have kept the faith, and in the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all all who have loved His appearing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. And the, 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 the word that I, I want to underline here is when He says, to all who have loved His appearing. That all there, brothers and sisters, that's you. That's me. Paul is looking ahead and he's saying, he's given it to me, I, I'm seeing it, I'm, I'm heading towards it, I've, I'm almost touching it. And all of you who are reading my words, you will also receive the same thing. So be strong and be courageous. Leave this world. Give up your disbelief. Come to Jesus for salvation and the guarantee of heaven and don't put it off. If you need to repent, then repent. If you need to be baptized, then be baptized. If you need to be restored, then do it. What will you exchange for your soul? Be strong, be courageous. Remember that the race is not to the swift or to the powerful, but to those who remain faithful until the end. I've told you in the past, it's not how fast you go. It's not how much you do along the way. It's if you finish or not. That's what's important. And so do you need help for the journey? Help to deal with something blocking your way or leading you off the path? Do you need help to simply carry on or help to begin the journey or come back to the journey? Let us therefore minister to you tonight with the courage and the strength of Christ that flows through the body of Christ which is this church. Let us baptize you. Let us hear your confession of faith. Let us hear your confession of sin. Let us hear your commitment to a faithful life in the future. Whatever you need, be strong, be courageous. Come forward now as we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.